as we've previously talked about in other podcasts, I've been sort of putting some opportunities out there for the people that are listening in to ask us a few questions. And a bit of a, a common pattern that's coming up is around challenging their emetophobia in relation to social anxiety or building social confidence. So I was hoping that we could dive into that a little bit today to hopefully give people a bit of a leg up when it comes to challenging that aspect of their emetophobia. So social anxiety, as me and you both know, plays a really large role within emetophobia. But for anyone that is listening in that doesn't understand how that links together, could you dive into that a little bit at first, just so that we can cover that that base? Yeah, okay. So social phobia or social anxiety or a lack of social confidence is, is, is an anxiety, a worry, a fear, ostensibly about being judged um, by other people, being embarrassed in front of other people. And like most things in life, these, this is a projection of how you feel about you. So on a very, very basic level, social anxiety is a projection of self-esteem. And we've got a very obvious example here, right? If I, if I felt really bad, if I felt insecure about being bald, and I felt bad about it, I would worry what other people thought about it, Okay. I would worry. If I was here now and I was insecure about being bald, I'd be thinking, crikey, all these people looking at you all young with your full set of hair and me and blah, 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 blah. And if someone shouted baldy as I was walking down the street, it might, you know, it might hurt and I might feel really bad. But if I'm happy about it, I'm never going to worry what anyone else thinks. If I'm happy about this shirt and I like it and I feel confident in it, I don't really care if you don't like it. Or, or if you say something about it, yeah? So if you're happy about it, for all your listeners, well, our listeners, should I say, that are watching this now, think about this now, ask yourself this. Think about part of either your body or the way you look or what you do. Think of a, a body part that you are most happy with. Okay? That you're most happy with. Is it your long legs? Have you got really nice hands? Is it that you're big, strong and muscly? Do you, do, have you got a lovely face? You know, have you got nice feet, right? Or other parts that we can't talk about on a podcast, right? Think about a part of your body that you're happiest about and then ask yourself, how often do I worry what other people think about that part? And almost certainly your answer is going to be never. They sit there and smile like you just did then, Joe, and think, no. Listen, I got I got great knees. You know, I love my ears. My my ears are brilliant. Or or you know, I got I I'm, I know I've got a great smile. I never worry about that. Okay, if you're happy about it, you don't worry what other people think about it. How, the opposite mm. is also yep. true. If you do worry about it, you are then going to worry that everyone else is going to pick up on that, or is going to see that as well. If I feel ridiculous being bald and looking like a bouncer it's going to be on my mind whenever I'm talking to anyone else and I might try and hide it I might try and avoid conversations I might try and avoid meetings and this kind of situation that we got now because I'm worrying and I'm, I'm feeling anxious that other people are out there thinking that I look like an idiot because I feel like an idiot so it's a projection of how you feel about you so what you find is on the TQ report, which, of course, we measure social anxiety and self-esteem, it's like a seesaw. It's like that. Okay? So as someone's self-esteem rises, their social anxiety will go down. Because as they're feeling better about themselves, they worry less what other people think. Okay? On the modern TQ report, of course, we measure them both in the positive, so we measure social confidence now, not social anxiety, so you see them both rise. But as someone's self-esteem goes up, their social anxiety will go down because there's less that they doubt and worry about in themselves or about themselves that they would worry about what other people would think about it. If you're happy with you, you really don't worry very much or care very much what other people think. And if they have got something to pick on, like you're looking unshaven today, right, or something like that, 
Okay, you're just going to go, well, you know, I beg to differ. I'm quite happy with it, so let's move on. And it's not going to bother you at all. But if you're already thinking, oh, God, I didn't shave today and I've got a podcast and I pick you up on it, you might you might create some anxiety about it, okay? But basically, if you're happy yep. about it, you don't worry about anyone else. So then you've got the situation mm. that almost all emetophobes, well, as far as we know, all emetophobes have low self-esteem. And partly they have low self-esteem because they tend to also be a perfectionist. And so they're putting themselves down a lot of the time or they feel they're not achieving what they should be achieving a lot of the time or they're feeling out of control or they're feeling panicky. So they're quite tough on themselves. They're quite hard on themselves. So even though almost all emetophobes are successful, motivated, driven people, their self-esteem tends to be very low. Even the very, very successful, well-known ones in, in film industry and in you know, celebrities and stuff that, that that you would think if I said you know oh this person you think oh my god her or his self-esteem must be through the roof but no if they've got emetophobia it's really low not for any other reason other than the fact that they're putting themselves down all the time or they're not praising themselves like you or I would do they're not recognizing their successes because they're setting their sights too high so what you find then is self-esteem social anxiety and perfectionism work off each other the more a perfectionist you are the more social anxiety you're likely to have because your self-esteem is likely to be lower the more you the more you worry about you the more you're going to worry about other people we talked on another podcast about um uh the, the fear of being out of control which is essentially what any phobia is really a fear of being emotionally out of control and of course if I was to be really embarrassed in public because I was ill, then I would feel massively out of control as well, wouldn't I? Because it would be really threatening, really challenging if I was to be ill on, on a bus, for example. So it would be incredibly challenging from the social anxiety part of it, but even more so for the fear of being out of control part of it. So when, when emetophobes talk about, oh, I, you know, I never go on a bus in case I was ill, I never go out in front of other people, I don't go to a pub in case I'm ill, that's more about their desire for control, not believing they'd cope with the social anxiety element than it is about the social anxiety itself. Because the biggest driver is always going to be, am I going to feel out of control? I don't believe I will cope if I feel overrun with emotions. So the biggest driver is always going to be that desire for control and the want to avoid a situation where I'm going to feel any kind of embarrassing emotions or draw attention to myself. So that then links with not feeling good enough. It links with a fear of being judged. It links with a fear of authority. Yeah, it's a massive projection of how I feel about me in my position, in my life, in the world at the moment, with this ridiculous, stupid phobia that I've got. And we talked about this before where most emetophobes don't tell their partner, don't tell their friends. And that's mostly because of social anxiety and, and feeling out of control. If my best friend did know, are they going to try and make me ill? Are they going to try and be ill in front of me for a laugh? It's best I don't tell anyone. I feel more in control if nobody around me knows I've got my phobia, because at least it's only me then that's got to manage it. So that plays into it as well. Yeah, I, I can I can attest to that one when I was going through my own metaphobic journey where, for example, you got me thinking about it. When I used to struggle a lot with long car journeys out of fear of I never actually used to get travel sick, but I always would worry because my desire for control was so high that, well, what if this is the one time where I do get travel sick, right? And when we used to drive abroad, because that was the only way we could possibly get over to France, because I would never hop on a, a plane flight. Sure. But I only just about felt comfortable to do long car journeys if it was with my family. I would never feel comfortable and I would create significantly more anxiety if it came to 
going on a long car journey with a friend, even if it was just a, you know, a best friend, right? Someone that I knew really well, but hadn't been with me growing up, didn't fully understand my phobia. I hadn't really spoken to about it in depth. Whereas my family, you know, they'd seen it all. They've seen me through the ups and downs and have dealt with me when I've been unwell. And so I, I didn't create, it was, it wasn't that much different to me in the way that I saw it to driving myself, right? Because I didn't create that social anxiety or have that you know, you know, element to it. Equally, you know that your mum, for example, isn't going to put you in a situation where you're likely to be ill. Your mum isn't going to challenge yeah. you on that. Your mum isn't going to get you to eat something and put something in it that you don't like because you thought it'd be funny. You know your mum has got your back, yeah. right? So you feel safer in that environment than you would do with a friend who... You mostly think they've got your back, but, you know, won't have it as much as your mum would do, would she? Especially if she's seen you thousands of times over the year, frightened and anxious. You know that your mum would support you and look after you. Yeah, so I would therefore feel more in control around my mum. So leads me on to a, a good question in relation to that. Would it be possible to have high coping skills... <coughs> but still create a lot of social anxiety? Would, would, would that be even remotely possible? Could I have really high coping skills, say, in relation to the vast majority of my life, but then still generate a great deal of social anxiety? Yes. That's my shortest answer ever. How about that? Just a yes. <laughs> what, what, Cheers, everyone. What exactly are you asking? So... If I felt like I could cope in a lot of emotionally uncomfortable environments, right? Yeah. I felt like I, you know, maybe every Sunday morning on my own, I would go and swim out a kilometer out into the middle of an ice cold lake and bob around and someone yeah. else that would be absolutely not, you know, I'd drown. It's going to be absolutely freezing. It's going to be uncomfortable. Why on earth would you do that? But I saw it as my alone time where I could switch off and, you know, enjoy that sort of almost meditative state of going and doing that. But it was really uncomfortable. You will never feel and anxious yet... or stressed in a situation where you feel powerful. Mm -hmm. So if you feel powerful yeah. okay. about going out and swimming a mile offshore, and whether that power is you're, you're a channel swimmer, so you feel you've got really good control skills, or you're so used to it that you've got really good coping skills as well it, it kind of almost doesn't matter but if you feel powerful you're not going to create stress and anxiety about it so yes it's entirely plausible that in every i mean a lot of emetophobes would say that in every other area of their life their life is great and brilliant and doing brilliantly and successful and happy and blah 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 it's only in this one area and that's because they've built both control and coping skills in that area but haven't built it around the area about being sick because, of course, they've avoided it all their life. They've always perceived it as being too challenging and so have avoided it. So they've built up their confidence and they've pushed themselves in other areas and made themselves go out and do things, but just not in that area enough because it's it's so um, frightening and stressful and you'd, the, 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 you'd feel so vulnerable doing that. And that comes back to our podcast from last week about coping skills. Because when you start to think about coping rather than avoiding, in any situation, the journey becomes significantly easier. Okay, mm, when, you, yeah. when you stop from thinking, I have to avoid, I have to avoid, I have to avoid, and think, well, do you know what? I don't have to avoid. Let me think about learning to cope. In that instant, it's a game changer. But emetophobes have always, always, yeah. always gone for a void. And, and then suffered the, you know, even with avoidance, most of the time they still suffer a tremendous amount of anxiety and stress, even when they're avoiding. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So just on the topic of social anxiety, it's something that I thought about, and it's definitely something that I've spoken about with clients before, is sometimes... I think anyway, people when they're reading through this can be a little bit affronted by the idea that maybe they have a lot of social anxiety, especially if they see themselves as someone that is 
very sociable and likes going out and they 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 enjoy other people's company and they go to parties and they they do these things and they feel like they can communicate i feel like again i'm just kind of going off my own basis here when i first went through the program many years ago is i almost felt like you were attacking me a little bit trying to suggest that i had social anxiety i didn't want to be seen as someone that Isn't... felt like they had social anxiety that put me in touch with some uncomfortable feelings right right but isn't that the nature so, isn't that the nature of social anxiety though? exactly right yeah exactly so in my in my eyes before i understood about social anxiety i saw social anxiety as just someone who is shy right as right. as someone that doesn't want to socialize right that was my very black and white view of what social anxiety was obviously before i studied psychology and had any idea about anything right but that was that's what i saw social anxiety as i'm not shy i like going out and speaking to lots of people so i can't possibly have social anxiety yeah. right and just that's how I fitted it around my own belief systems. So I do, you know, just want to bring that one into discussion because as I say, it's definitely something that I've had to talk through with clients before where they've said, well, you know, I'm, I am confident, I am outgoing, so I don't have social anxiety. What do you mean I have social anxiety? Which of course creates a bit more of a barrier for us to climb yeah, over. Maybe there should be a to, line to, in the address. manual. There should be a line in the manual after the opening bit that says, if you are now feeling slightly affronted by reading that, then that does confirm that you probably do have some social anxiety. It's funny because also, I don't ever remember a client being feeling any resistance to that. Interesting. But but then, I I I had, I had probably. Well, it's difficult, isn't it? Because it, it, were you studying the manual at home or were you with a coach? I was studying it. I was studying uh, initially at home. Initially, when you felt when you when you coach. felt yeah. and I quote affronted by reading the bit about social anxiety, mm -hmm. were you at that moment with a coach or were you at that moment at home? I believe at home. I mean, you are taking me back about ten years mm -hmm. now, but I think. I think at home. So, yeah. so it could, I mean, it could it could be who you're with at the time. It could be the way you were thinking about mm. it at the time. It could be also that if if you hadn't previously watched the support video that talked a little bit more about social anxiety, and you kind of went in cold, then I then I'd get that, you know, because it feels like mm. you're being told something that you're not. But don't forget. Everyone is challenged by two or three points as they go through, because if they weren't, yeah. they wouldn't have a metaphobia. You know, that's, mm. that's, that's why we had to make it an evidence-based program, because people would understandably not want to argue at, at every point, but, you know, I, I find the opposite is true. I, I found that, that with clients... The biggest shock to them is realizing that their self esteem is low. Mm, yeah. Because they come in and they're the chairman of ICI or they own Tesco's or they're a successful this, that, or the other. And when you talk to them and, and, and they get it, and because their immediate thought is, what? No self esteem? You know, do, I know, do you know what I do for a living? Mm. Do you know, you know? And when you delve into it slightly further, and they really understand that it means, you know, what you feel about you. They get yeah. it. But that is the nature of these yes. things, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so leading into that, then, how can people start to go about challenging their social anxiety and start to build up social confidence? Because another thing that I do hear quite often is as they're starting to go through the program, as they're starting to build up all areas of their foundations and feel more and more powerful about overcoming their phobia, they start to, again, this is, you know, not absolutely everyone. I am generalizing a little bit here, but it is a, a similar pattern that I've heard quite a few times is I'm starting to feel a lot more confident and capable if I were to be sick on my own, if yes. I was at home alone, um, or if I was dealing with my, my wife or my brother or my family member that I live with, I feel like I could cope around that. But the idea 
of it in public. That still that still feels like a million miles away to me right now. Yeah, Joe. yeah. So that that's easy one, right? So those people that would that would voice that are 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 at a part of the program where they haven't yet actively sought to build their social confidence. Because of course, when you when you get when you get to that point where you are starting to feel better, you're feeling more powerful, you're feeling a bit more in control, uh, and you know, and ninety percent of that comes from understanding what was causing the phobia in the first place, right? You're understanding that it's not something happening yeah. to you. It was never about being sick in the first place. It's all about the way you're thinking about it. When they start to get that, they feel massively empowered. But of course, that massive empowerment doesn't defeat any social anxiety they just feel empowered at that point you now need to go out and do things they're going to build that social confidence so um number one really working hard on the self-esteem we know emetophobes suffer with that um because they're perfectionists they don't like praising themselves and and doing the positives list you know a lot of them struggle when they first do the positive list and they would say to you but i haven't i you know I haven't cured anyone of cancer in the last week. I haven't helped an old lady across the road. And you have to explain, we're not looking for massive things. We're looking for the hundreds of small things every day that someone with high self-esteem, and I think our next podcast can be on self-esteem, so I don't talk too much. Someone with high self-esteem and good, stable self-esteem has lots of nice thoughts about themselves every day. Lots of thoughts about them uh, being a good, nice likable kind worthwhile person a person that has low self-esteem doesn't have those thoughts so it's sometimes just the absence of those thoughts so getting to that point if you feel that you're at this moment more confident or about the ability to cope at home but you still feel oh my god if i did it at school if i did it at work that'd be the worst thing in the world still that's only because at that moment you haven't yet started to challenge and create some social confidence and how would you do that slowly and carefully the same way you do everything okay you'd start building your self-esteem and you'd start going out a little bit i wouldn't expect you to go straight out and and go on a bus but you could you could so you go for a walk to the end of the road and then next day go a bit further and the next day a bit further and then when you do go on a bus for the first time just go one stop and get off and then next time go Mm. two stops and get off okay Yep. You know, this is about the exposure element to to situations. Praise yourself for having done it. Praise yourself. Pat yourself on the back. Recognize that you have just been on a bus and it was all right and you didn't panic. And then the next time you go on a bus, it's going to be a little bit easier because of the memory and the processing from the previous time. That graded, gradual building up your experience and your confidence in it. Because you've got to remember again. At base, this was never about being sick. Okay, so the fear of going on uh, the fear of going on the bus was never a fear of being sick on the bus. It was a fear of being emotionally out of control and terrified and anxious on the bus. Okay, so the moment your confidence level increases in your ability to cope. The anxiety disappears very, very quickly because it was never actually about the bus. You feel it's about the bus. You picture it think, oh, I can't do that. I'm not going on that bus. There's no way I can do that. I can't get in the aeroplane. There's no way I can fly on holiday. You know, I've, I've known people, you know, wh- whose family go on holiday to the south of France for summer. They all fly, but the emetophobe drives himself. It takes two days to get there because mm-hmm. they don't want to get in an aeroplane. And when they feel that huge anxiety about the aeroplane, it feels like... It's the aeroplane creating the anxiety. But, of course, it's not. It's about my confidence in my ability to cope on an aeroplane. So the moment I start to increase my coping skills and my belief in my coping skills, the anxiety starts to shrink because it was never about the aeroplane. Yes, yeah. So my, my, my confidence in my ability to tolerate being burgled at gunpoint isn't going to decrease right because that's it that, that that's a genuinely frightening situation for most people right unless you're an armed police officer right you're a black belt in taekwondo or something okay 
having someone kick your back door down and point a gun at you is always going to be terrifying. Okay, that's a real threat. Okay, that person, this situation could genuinely do you some significant harm. You're right to be anxious right now. Okay, but that was never about that airplane. You weren't ever actually afraid of being sick on the airplane. You were afraid of your mm. emotional reaction to being sick on the airplane or on the bus. Yep. So the moment you feel more yep. confident in your ability to cope, and only you only need that much more confident in your ability to cope, your anxiety decreases because your anxiety was about feeling emotionally out of control. It was never about being sick. And of yep. course, yep. So of course, when you are challenging, sorry, being, Rob, go on. being sick is unpredictable, right? Managing emotions isn't. Once you've got control over your emotions, once you're able to manage your emotions, once you've got good coping skills, that's a very predictable skill set. So that's why people get better. Yeah, that's, how, that's why people are able to overcome their metaphobia because it was never about that unpredictable one time in every 10 or 15 years you're ill. It was always about you're, you're feeling panicky and out of control and worrying about feeling emotionally terrified, anxious, vulnerable, on the spot, really embarrassed. And I, and I don't believe I would cope with those emotions, therefore I have to avoid it. So once you've made the emotions more predictable, the phobia goes. Yeah, and that's why... Yeah. Yeah, very, very few people are terrified of being burgled at gunpoint, right? Unless they are unfortunate enough to live in an area where it happens regularly. Most people in the UK, right? It's it's so unlikely to happen. I don't think I've ever been consulted by someone with a fear of being burgled. Maybe someone that's recently been burgled and it hasn't kind of managed to calm their emotions down yet, right? Or Or, or hasn't processed it well yet. But generally speaking, most people in this country don't have a pathological fear of being burgled. Even though it, it's a million to one chance that it will happen, their belief is that they would cope, therefore they don't worry. If you believe you'd cope, you don't worry. Yes, yeah. So as you're building up these coping skills and you're beginning to challenge your social anxiety, because as we've addressed, that is of the utmost importance it's really important not to try and throw yourself in at the deep end because that it's you know that in itself would be counterproductive you want to find your start point your your beginning point so if your challenge is to you're thinking okay i really want to sign up to that new art class i want to go along to there i, I want to meet these new people i know i'm not going to be that good at art so it's going to be a bit challenging because there's going to be all of these other people that are more skilled than me and I'm going to have to put up with that and I've got to speak to all these new people and you're getting yourself really overwhelmed and that feels like it's at this moment in time as you're working on yourself far out of your depth why don't you go along with a, a partner why don't you go along with your boyfriend to start with just because you start by going along with your boyfriend it doesn't mean that you then need to carry on doing that there's nothing wrong with tweaking the circumstances just a little bit to begin with to make it a bit more manageable and then you can start bringing it all back to yourself and making it just that little bit more applicable. But trying to throw yourself in and get rid of absolutely everything straight away and just do it perfectly is, of course, going to be unhelpful because you're just going to spend the whole time in a massive ball of anxiety. And it only tends to be those that haven't yet overcome their perfectionism that would do that. OK, the perfectionists mm -hmm. listening to you saying that now will be thinking, you know, I'm not going to do that. I, sh I should be stronger. I should be able to do this. I should be able to throw myself in at the deep end and go straight in and score, you know, 10 out of 10. They th they won't like the idea that they've got to have someone with them, kind of babysitting them on, on, on their first few journeys to the art class. But of course, they need to realise that's their perfectionism talking. That's their black and white thinking talking. That's really unhelpful. Everything is about doing it gently okay slowly yep. gently carefully safely building a skill set 
at a at a speed and level which is safe and okay for you you've got to push yourself and you've got you've got to you've got to do that okay but you've got only got to push yourself far enough right that you'd get a benefit from having done it but not so far that you're going to create so much anxiety and stress you won't do it again and it feels like a step backwards like i'm yep. still doing my couch to 5k right how far would i need to run today in order to feel yes rob well done you did better than yesterday but not so far that i tie myself out or get stitched and, right i'm giving up i'm not doing that anymore so it's a subtle you need to figure out where your point is and if you're terrified of leaving the house then your first step might just be opening the door and standing in the doorway for five minutes and then coming back the next hour and doing it for 10 or for another five or for six or seven, eight, nine, ten. You work a minute at a time and then the next day or the next week you stand outside the door, you know, build it up. You're building your confidence slowly and, and comfortably. And then you walk out the gate and then you walk half the way to the end of the street and then to the end of the street and then around the block and then to the park and then you get on the bus and go one stop or, or two stops and then three stops and you slowly build that skill set without frightening yourself because then you take a step back or you or you create a blip and then you're you know then, then you're really anxious and stressed for two days three days four days five days pushing yourself far enough that you're that you've that anyone any of your peers or family or friends loved one would say you know crikey well done joe far enough that mm -hmm. you've achieved something but not so far that you've created so much stress and anxiety that you're on your back for the next two days and the yeah, same goes yeah. for every aspect that, that, of the program yes yeah the the whole perception of what the achievement and the goal should be is completely specific to the way in which you're viewing it because you know ask yourself would you feel confident and capable about walking out onto a stage and delivering a stand-up comic set right off the bat? And if the answer, which it probably is, no, right, I wouldn't want to walk out in front of 100 people and start trying to practice my best dad jokes, then how would you start to build up to that point, right? Maybe you would go and sign up to the improv class and start going along to those every Wednesday night. And then you would start practicing it at your tiny little local pub where you know everyone there. Yeah. And then you would gradually start building up to it. But if, of course, if you've got that perfectionist mindset, then it's, okay, well, I have to be able to go and walk out onto the yeah. stage in front of 100 people and yeah. deliver it straight away. But that doesn't make sense. And I'm sure that even if you are a perfectionist listening into this, you can understand that and see that, well, of course, that would be unrealistic. So it's about assessing what is realistic and what is unrealistic and gradually working your way towards the end goal. But doing it, as you say, at a steady and comfortable pace, as long as you are getting yourself into a little bit of discomfort, realizing you're not made of glass, and then continually moving onwards. Agreed. One point I didn't make earlier, which I was just thinking about, was I often say, we often say, that the, the only major reason for the discrepancy between the percentage of females that have emetophobia in males, as we know, it's, it's, you know, almost entirely female, you know, the research says somewhere between like four and 12% males, right? Um, mm. we've, uh, we've always said it is mostly down to disgust propensity, but of course, disgust propensity in a way is a function of social anxiety. And we know that women have a, a girls particularly have a lot more social anxiety than boys. Okay. They respond to authority more than boys do. Okay. Particularly in the UK, they work harder in school. Okay. Because of, because they feel the pressure more than boys do in school, right? They work harder. There's lots more social pressures on girls to look good or look a certain way. There's much less social pressure on boys to do that. So then by the time you get to, six seven eight nine ten in in the uk canada australia america particularly girls suffer much more social anxiety and are on the receiving end of much more social pressure than boys are 
that linked with the fact that um, disgust propensity is kind of linked to that is the reason why more girls, more women have emetophobia than boys. So social anxiety is that big an issue. You know, if you didn't have social anxiety, you could not have emetophobia. Right? In the same yeah. way as you yeah. cannot create a chocolate cake without chocolate. Right? Without a lot of social anxiety, in, in, in the true nature of what social anxiety is, what we've talked about today, not a fear of public speaking, right? Social anxiety, that worry of the social press, that worry about what other people think of you, judging you, feeling not good enough, which, of course, is a very external thing in the first place, isn't it? It's a hugely external thing. Yep. Um, without that, you couldn't have a metaphobia. Yep. Um, Rob, can you just quickly clarify just for the people listening that aren't completely aware of what disgust propensity is, what it is so that they can make that clear link between the two. Yeah, so disgust propensity is your propensity, how much you dislike or hate or would avoid um, feelings of disgust, particularly focused on bodily functions and and your body. So things like um, uh, being sick, um, going to the toilet, uh, we sweat, um, you know, uh, perspiring, uh, tastes, sensations, having smelly feet, and anything, anything to do with um, bodily, uh, mainly bodily actions that would lessen your belief that that you looked like a good girl or a lady or a or a, a good woman or a nice woman or or anything that would detract mm -hmm. from that right you know if if you or i were having a chat here in my office and one of us had a runny nose being blokes we'd probably find that funny okay as as a female with a metaphobia that might be perceived as disgust oh that's disgusting joe crikey can you stop that Okay, so that's disgust propensity. And and I'll give you a really, really good example. Um, you and I, not at the same time, I hasten to add, started weeing in front of other boys probably when we we're about three years old. Yeah? At Thanks the for arrival. clarifying the starting point there. Yeah? Yep. I want to clarify that, okay? I was not there when you first started doing that, okay? But you and I started weeing, having our private parts out and urinating, which is one of the most personal private things a human being can do right uh, and very on the spot and, and and potentially embarrassing we started doing that around three three and a half years old and did it two or three times a day at play school whatever and whatever anxiety or embarrassment we had originally about our private parts and doing something so very very personal while watching other people in fact what we were really doing is playing weren't we, we were trying who could we the highest who could you know, we the we the little disinfectant block further down the tube and this kind of stuff, right? So most boys are over their social anxiety about their bodily symptoms and, and their bodily fluids and their private parts before they get to kind of five, six, seven. Okay? And then we're laughing about yeah. and then we have willy battles and, and all the ridiculous things that we do, right? Many women go their entire life and never show their private parts to another human being. Mary has never weed in front of another human being. And I wouldn't be surprised, and I'm sure she'll tell me if I ask her, she probably, the time she did sleep with her husband, okay, she probably had a nightdress on or something like that. I'm sure her husband never saw her naked. Okay, because it's mm. private and it's personal and it's, you know, in this country, in the UK, it's still against advertising standards to advertise female sanitary wear in anything other than mm. a very delicate, you know, there are lots of jokes, aren't there, about tampon adverts where you see a lady cycling down the road on a summer's day or running across a, a lovely field of daisies, and yep. that's advertised tampon. And that's because you're not allowed to advertise tampons like the way they advertise nappies, which is dipping it in a bowl of red flu and say look how good these sanitary towels are 
okay? Because that would mm. be considered, you, you couldn't do that. That's disgust propensity. You're still not allowed yes. to do yeah. that. In this day and age, it's still not talked about. It's still not talked about. In certain cultures, which I won't mention, certain cultures, you're not even allowed to sleep with your wife during that time of the month. It's considered so dirty yeah. and disgusting and horrible. That's, that's, the, that's the nature of disgust propensity. That's where it comes from. Probably comes from men. I'm absolutely certain most things do, right? But it comes from people's attitudes towards bodily fluids and, and um, that kind of thing. So the word emetophobia in itself doesn't actually mean being sick. It's about the emission of a bodily fluid. Yeah, mm. emission of a bodily fluid. Wow. It, I didn't. I, you know what? I, I've spent all of these years studying metaphobia, and I didn't know that. Yeah. Interesting. Learn something new every so it's day. It's about I the emission of a bodily that. fluid. It's not specific, or, or it shouldn't be specific to being sick. It could be the emission of any bodily fluid, because any, the emission of any bodily fluid. Would be, uh, you know, considered very embarrassing. But on that, just on that note as well, think about this. I don't ever recall being consulted, and I don't ever remember having an email either when I was a therapist or, or running the Fry program. I don't ever recall having an email from someone or help needing help from someone who had coprophobia. Okay, which is fear of losing bowel control the fear of shitting in public or spontaneously okay now you would have thought right if you ask anyone that hasn't got a metaphobia if one of those two things had to happen one day on the train which would you which would be the worst most people would say shit because most people yeah. that haven't got a metaphobia yeah, would perceive would perceive poo as a far more embarrassing excuse me, disgusting thing than vomit. But they're missing the point. It's not mm. about the bodily fluid. It's not about the bodily function, okay? Mm. It's about feeling emotionally out of control, okay? And you don't tend to feel emotionally out of control, even if you had diarrhoea. I've never, I've never ever heard anyone consult a therapist for a fear of diarrhoea, even though how embarrassing yeah. was that if it happened on the train? Yeah, yep. it's 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 not about being sick. It's not about going to the loo. It's about those thinking styles and those beliefs and, and desire for control and fear of being out of control and how powerful you feel and social anxiety and self-esteem and disgust propensity and the higher levels of social anxiety and, and, and the, the physiological feelings of feeling out of control if you're going to be ill. Fantastic. Okay, thank you. I feel like we've given some really beneficial insights there around all of those elements. So I hope you've taken something from it. Anything else you want to add, Rob? All happy on my end. If if people are finding this interesting and they have social anxiety, I'd suggest they watch the the podcast from last week on on building coping skills because it's essentially the same thing. Yes, yep. You don't, you know, you 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 can start to overcome social anxiety. You don't have to focus on overcoming your anxiety in relation to being sick. You can you can focus on overcoming social anxiety and building social confidence in any socially confident situation. Okay, it it, it could mm. be you know um, learning to do public speaking. It could be e even just posting some stuff on on TikTok, exposing yourself mm. to social situations that you wouldn't normally do tolerating the discomfort processing it well and kind of moving on from there one of one of the guys one of the thrive coaches i took through a few years back wasn't from metaphobia but there was some social anxiety there and he worked in london and i said okay every every day for the next couple of weeks when you get off the tube the first homeless person you see i want you to give them a couple of quid but also i want you to squat down on their level and have a chat with them. I don't just mean say, have a nice day. I mean, actively engage in a conversation while all your suited colleagues are walking around you, looking at you thinking, why is that guy talking to the homeless guy? 
And he overcame a mm. tremendous amount of social anxiety by doing that. Blindy, one of our coaches, who's not practicing at the moment because you can't see at all now, but, but um, Blindy um, overcame a tremendous amount of social anxiety when she went to the Thrive program because her coach got her to do two things, really simple things. One is to put a spelling mistake in every single email she wrote for two weeks. She had to do it on purpose and tolerate it. Another thing she had to do was wear odd socks for two weeks. Okay? Mm. And putting herself directly in the line of fire from wearing odd socks to work, right? One pink, one blue. And by repeatedly sending out several emails a day with a spelling mistake in, knowing that as a perfectionist, she'd be really annoyed with herself for doing that and knowing that someone reading it is going to see that, and just learning to tolerate those feelings, she overcame a tremendous amount of social anxiety and built lots of confidence from that. Yeah. Okay. You know what the, uh, the, the first, the, the, the base layer and the first one that I always get my clients to challenge because it's one that, you know, anyone can do is, you know, when you're walking down the street and you walk by someone and you see the, the classic lips pursed, eyebrow raised, not the, that, right? Yeah. Instead of doing that, make firm eye contact and just say hi and then scurry off yeah. right and then build from there you know force yourself to say hello and then keep developing from that point yeah. force yourself to not just glance down at the concrete as you walk by them be anyone can do that one be right be and for, for some people it's going to put them in a lot of discomfort absolutely. initially and don't, and don't, go from there and, and don't forget right this is this is this is not just one way it's a plus and minus thing Every time you avoid doing that, you're building more social anxiety. Every time you're walking down the street and you think, oh, there's a person coming, I'm going to look at the floor, you're creating more social anxiety. You're not staying neutral. You're adding to your social anxiety. Mm. Okay, You're lowering your self-esteem because for whatever reason, you don't feel good enough or strong enough or important enough to look that person in the eye as they're walking past you. So it's not a question yeah. of it's not a question of not doing these things. You're in a neutral position. That's not true. You are adding to mm. your social confidence. Sorry, adding to your social anxiety by not doing those things. Every opportunity you've got to push the boundaries of your social confidence, you should do. Even if you only push them a tiny, tiny bit, and you'll reap the benefits very, very quickly. Yep. Yep. So get started doing it straight away. If it, if it was me listening to this podcast for the first time, I had a lot of social anxiety. The idea of saying hello to someone in the street made me feel all uncomfortable. Go and do it straight away. Make 10 minutes this afternoon out of your day, walk down to the shops and make yourself say hello to two people on the way down. You can do that today. You can do that straight away. Don't wait until next week. Don't wait until from Monday onwards. Go and do that and then feel so bloody proud of yourself for doing that when you get back home. Process it, make yourself feel really good about it. See it for the big step that it actually is. Don't minimize it or belittle it or tell yourself that that was easy and I can't believe I created such a big fuss over that for so many years. Praise yourself and then move on and then set another task and another goal. But get started straight away. Don't wait. Don't, don't put it off. The antidote, the absolute antidote to low self-esteem and high social anxiety and perfectionism is being kind to yourself, being loving towards yourself. Treat yourself Absolutely. the way you treat somebody that you loved, not somebody that you hated or were angry with or annoyed with or upset with. Treat yourself as if you were somebody that you loved. What would you say to somebody you loved that did that for the first time? You'd say, oh my God, that was brilliant. Well done, mate. And you really mean it. Yeah? Yep. Lovely. Good one.